I'll just use this as an example. It's not the clearest picture, but if you look at it, see, as you're going into a curve, who knows what the apex of the this turn would be? Yeah. The, the top. So <clears throat> basically, yeah, where B is. So as you're going, you want to do all your braking as you're going into the turn, right? Then you start turning, and just past the apex is when you want to start accelerating again. So um, that, that's the best way to do cornering, and you guys will get to experience that when you go up to the track. So um, if, if you do, if you break when you're in the curve, chances are you're going to oversteer and potentially roll. So that, that's the best thing to do. So, um, anybody have questions? Like I said, I, I think I shaved off probably 20 minutes with the videos not working. So, <clears throat> you're welcome. <laughs> Do you have any other questions, Bruce? No.
find out. Yeah. So everybody has a seat. We can get started. stuff um, like Bruce was saying he adjusts his a little bit more so when they're out so when a car is coming up he can watch it and just as it starts to disappear he can see it in the other mirror in the rear mirror so with bigger cars that's easier um, like I mentioned we talk the talk about the rear passenger handles just with our recruits just because it's easier because they back into a lot of stuff and when we're going through cone maneuvers and all that stuff it's good for them to do that way and then our friend from the ATF wants more room when you're stopping at a stoplight because he's worried about terrorists. <laughs> you, you, I have to give him a hard time because or X Y. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I had to give him a hard time too because my current current assignment I was signed out of the JTTF and I do terrorism stuff, so we we have a little friendly banter between the FBI and ATF. All right, we'll keep going. So. We could have hydroplane today. There was a little bit of snow or rain out there, right? Who's hydroplane and got that seat of the pants? Oh, I better slow down. Yeah, um, it, it happens. And, and like um, in one of the videos, it talked about you know the first couple minutes of any rainstorm is where all the oils and everything is coming out of the roads, and it makes it slick. So um, it says up there, it can occur in a, as little as a sixteenth inch of water with a four thousand pound car at fifty miles an hour. So. That water is just getting compressed out, and when it can't, that's when you kind of hydroplane. So to recover from it, you don't want to brake. You just let off the gas, hold the steering wheel in place, and your car will kind of slow down. I think this is a video of some hydroplane. The weather can present traffic hazards. Take rain. It's a hazard from the moment the first drops fall. This is when rain first mixes with oil and dust on the pavement. It's very slick. This is what happens. The dirt and oil float to the top of the water. So tires ride not only on the slippery surface of water, but also directly on the even more slippery surface of oil and dirt. It's no wonder so many crashes happen just after it starts raining. Eventually, dust and oil wash away, but plenty of hazards remain. Rain, especially heavy rain, limits your ability to see. It's hard for you to see what's going on, and it's hard for other people to see you. In addition to making it difficult to see, rain keeps roads slippery. Traction becomes a critical issue, and hydroplaning, a real danger. Three main factors cause a car or truck to hydroplane. Speed, tread depth, and water depth. The faster your car or truck goes, the more traction you lose on a wet surface. The more worn your tires are, and the shallower the tread, the more likely your car is to hide it from. Even a thin layer of water can cause your car to lose traction. But as the water gets deeper, you lose traction sooner. It all happens in a space no bigger than the bottom of a size 9 shoe. Now picture this. It's a smooth roadway. There's moderate rain. And you're traveling at 60 miles per hour. Under these conditions, each tire has to move away about one gallon of water every second. All the space no bigger than this shoe. Each gripping element of the tread is on the ground even less time, one fiftieth of a second. During this fleeting moment, the gripping element must move the water from beneath the tire and then grip the road surface. If this doesn't happen, your car may likely hydroplane. When a car hydroplanes, the most important thing that someone needs to remember is don't panic. First, do not brake or accelerate suddenly. 
That'd be understeer. Ladies, a loss of traction to the front tires, some braking on a front or rear wheel drive. So as the front tires that blocks the rear tires. Oversteer. This can cause a spin. Also, sudden acceleration on a front or rear wheel drive may take the vehicle straight ahead. This could be dangerous if the vehicle is pointed toward the edge of the road. According to some driving experts, what you should do depends on the type of vehicle you're in. Listen for the type of vehicle you drive. A front wheel drive with an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. Front wheel drive without an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. A rear wheel drive with an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. If you begin to hydroplane one of these types of cars, then some driving experts suggest you do this. Look for open space and plan to travel in that direction. Stay lightly on the accelerator and steer gently toward the open space which you have down. If you are in a rear wheel drive without an anti-lock brake system and traction control system, then do this. Look for open space and plan to travel in that direction. Ease off the accelerator and steer towards the open space which you have identified. Traction control systems, by the way, have been installed in vehicles for a number of years now, but everyone may not be familiar. This is a system that prevents Clearly, this is a little bit of a video. If your vehicle has a traction control system, there should be an icon indicating so on your dashboard. Another note, it's important not to have the cruise control engaged in the heavy rain due to a sudden acceleration problem. The vehicle will recognize the water buildup as a slowdown and ask for more power. This need for more power may shift, causing the vehicle to shift to a lower gear and build more water under the tires. This causes a cycle of more power and more push on the front tires. You can avoid hydroplaning by making sure the tread on your tires is thick enough and by slowing down. Here's a good rule of thumb for checking your tread. Stick a penny upside down in your tread. If Lincoln's head is hidden, then your tread is thick enough. If the tread doesn't hide Lincoln's head, then your tread is too thin and you need new tires. When it comes to speed on a wet road, slow down by about one third of what you would normally drive. For example, if you normally drive 60 miles per hour on a dry highway, slow down to 40 when it's wet. Everybody does that, right? <laughs> We're in a hurry, we wanna get places. All right. We are never going to encounter any of these things, so we're not going to talk about them. I'm just kidding. Colorado has every one of these probably in the morning, right? Every day. Every day, yeah. So we're going to come across this stuff. So just be ready for it. The video already kind of talked about this. Um, but basically, bad weather, it can cause you to slide or skid. It changes your braking. Obviously, if there's wet stuff on the ground, brake sooner. Um, ABS braking, like he was talking about in that video, like it's a newfangled thing, but we've all probably had it in our cars for a while now. Um, just let the, the car is smart, let the car do its, its work. Um, just slow and steady is the key thing. And then just be aware of that black ice and shadows. Again, give yourself an out. Will it play? No. All right. Well, this is a uh, video from probably the late 80s, judging by the car. It's just a bunch of people driving stupid, not knowing how to drive in the snow, and them crashing into a lot of stuff. So you guys are missing all the good ones. So obviously driving on snow and ice, we have to accelerate uh, slow, more, more slower. I Accelerate slowly, decelerate slowly. That way we're not getting any, any, any issues. And then drive slowly all, all together and increase that distance because we don't want to crash into that person in front of us. And I'm not telling you to run stop signs. What I'm telling you is um, slow down, don't stop, break that traction. Because if, if you're still going and you can see that you're, you're in the clear, keep going. But if there's oncoming traffic, Stop, obey all the, all the traffic signals and everything. Uh, don't be overconfident in your four-wheel drive. Four-wheel drive, right, not four-wheel stop. And even though it's four-wheel drive, it doesn't always make us go forward as well, right? So we need to pay, keep paying attention to that. And then going uphill, just slow and steady. That wins the race. 
always look for that way out, um, especially in the snow. You, you want to be paying attention to what's going on because if, if somebody slides out this way, you're going to want to be able to go out this way a little bit. And then talks about compression braking, just, just little braking at a time. You don't want to slam on the brakes and make the ABS go and your tires make that tick tick sound. You just want to compression real, real slow. Maybe this one will work. Nope. Just another one with ice driving. I'm going to save you guys like 20 minutes of videos with this one. All right. So, something must have happened when we changed it to your Apple from a regular computer. Because on here, the, the main thing says, uh, this is talking about safe backing procedures. Um, what makes it so hard to back up? And I mentioned it before, our, our deputies, they like to back into stuff no matter what. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of it, I, I've done it myself. So it's just hard to see, uh, especially now um, with everything that's in the cars. One accident I had, I was up in Conifer and I was backing up in a parking lot and I was looking in the rear view mirrors, checking everything out, but the bad part was, was the cage in the back with the plexiglass. So I was looking at myself in the mirror and I couldn't see the pole behind me and bam, I hit it right on. So it's hard to see. Um, a lot of cars have backup cameras now, but sometimes that is delayed a little bit and it doesn't give you that full picture, that full 3D picture. So use it for what it is, but don't just stare at it as you're backing up. That's what the mirrors are for. Um, as you're backing up, we talk about that trailing wheel adjustment. You, you want to be careful of that front end swing because as you're backing up, if you're if you turn your wheels this way, your front end is going to swing out and hit something on the left side if you're just paying attention to what's on the right side. And then uh, that caster effect, just when you're letting go of the wheel, it'll want to, your car will want to straighten itself back out. And then people, and, and I've seen this in our end services a lot. Um, when we're going through cone patterns and I'm, I'm standing there talking to someone and I say, all right, now turn left and it takes a minute and then, oh, okay, we'll go this way. And then, okay, now turn right. And it just takes a minute. So that's what it's talking about, delayed steering response. Everybody's not as comfortable driving in reverse because we don't do it a lot. So this shows up here, um, that front end swing, that's a little stop sign or cone up there. As you got the wheel turned all the way that way, you got to pay attention because you're going to hit that thing. I, I always have to joke about this part, always park, park to minimize backing. So that's why you see cop cars backed into the parking spots everywhere. Because then they can run to their cars, get, get out of there as fast as they can. I also, um, and you'll laugh at this, I teach a surveillance class as well, and it's hard to break cops from backing into parking spots because you don't want to back into a parking spot to watch a bad guy. You, you want to park away from them so you can watch them in the mirror. So that's, that's a hard part to teach as well. So, but um, for, for your guys' purposes, just know that backing is a tough thing. Um, back slowly. That way there's no need to fly into parking spots, any, anything you're doing. Um, constantly, you don't want to be focused so much on the mirrors or that backup camera. You want to be paying attention to what's in front of you as well. Um, and then, like it says there, 90% is looking in the rear, but 10% is in the front. You just, you want to pay attention to what's going on in front of you as well. Who knows how many collisions are in a traffic accident? Three. Yep, you got it. So obviously you got the vehicle impact, then your body impact, and then all your organ impact. So, makes sense. And this will show, this video will hopefully show you what that's about. I'm thinking the newer ones actually work better. I guess my dated 80s and 90s videos need to be up. Any crash, whatever you see, the car stops, but everything inside keeps moving. Thank you. 
need the best protection. You're still alive. That's just getting out there. Obviously, the faster you go, the more chances you are getting hurt. We talked about this a little bit before. Obviously, the bottom right is a nice old car made of a lot of metal, um, and it would crush people around them. Not, not so good, right? So now we have these modern crumple zones where um, the passenger compartment is a fairly safe place, so because everything uh, crumples there. So we talked about it a little bit before. Mainly people are the reasons behind crashes. Sometimes the highway design, and sometimes it's, it's vehicle design or vehicle issues. Um, again, with the semi after the I-71, who remembers the C-471 right between Bowles and King Carl? Tire blew out on the front driver's side, caused him to veer over, went across the median, took out a car, and went down on the bike path. Um, the vehicle, the tire just blew. It was nothing the driver could necessarily do to, to help that. The next video just is GM's version of the stability control. Everybody has their own um, version of stability control. So if this plays, it'll just show you how the vehicle, they're, they're smart now and how it, it talks about how the cars work. However, when surprises occur and the driver needs to take sudden invasive action, it's easy to overcorrect, and this can lead to a skid and loss of control. Stabilitrack can sense when this starts to happen and stabilizes the vehicle by controlling the brakes and, if necessary, the engine. Stabilitrack is comprised of the following components a speed sensor on each wheel. A rotation brake sensor measures the vehicle's lateral speed and rotation around its center line. And a steering angle sensor that reports the driver's steering intention. From the sensor signals, the control unit computes when and how it has to intervene. And the hydraulic unit regulates brake pressure. What happens during the first steering maneuver? The driver has to swerve quickly to the left. The steering angle sensor transmits this to the Stabilitrack control unit. But the rotation rate sensor signals that the vehicle is drifting straight ahead toward the obstacle. In split seconds, Stabilitrack breaks the left rear wheel very briefly and sharply. This produces the desired counteracting force so that the vehicle responds as the driver intends. What happens when you react to bring the vehicle back into its lane? When you pull the wheel over after avoiding the obstacle, the rear end tends to break away to the left. The turning force to the right is higher than the driver wants. In this case, Stabilitrack breaks the left front wheel. The turning force is reduced. Instead of going into a skid, the vehicle stays in control thanks to Stabilitrack. In higher center of gravity vehicles such as SUVs, a sharper and more severe steering maneuver can actually create enough tire road friction to cause the vehicle to tip over without leaving the road. In these rare cases, Stabilitrack senses the rapid steering maneuver and the lateral speed of the vehicle. So basically, cars are smart. They try and help you to avoid rolling over or going into those oversteer moments. In a crash, there's, these are the top uh, reasons behind a crash. Obviously, we talk about speed. Drunk driving is a big one. Distractions, cell phone, weather. Uh, red lights are intersections, and we'll talk about intersections specifically here in a little bit. And then fatigue, like we talked about earlier. Speed, we, we want to get where we're going, but we want to get there in one piece so we can help the people we're trying to get there. I mentioned that before, so this is another video. Just to talk about it's not worth um, speeding to get to places. And it's not going to work. So, basically, guy in the silver car is, is coming to the stop sign. Um, obviously, it's a, another country because it's on the wrong side of the road. 
He's got his kids in the back seat. He looks down the road, um, sees this white car coming down, thinks, okay, I got enough time. He looks to make sure he can, can cross into the path. And before he, so then he starts rolling forward. And before he knows it, th this white car is speeding up. And then it's like a slow motion thing. And the, the car stop, both drivers get out. And the, the driver in the silver car says, dude, I got my kids in my car. What are you in such a hurry for? Um, and he says, sorry, I, was, I just need to get somewhere fast. And so they have this conversation and they get back both in their cars and then there's a crash. So it's just a, a little manipulation on that, that it's not worth speeding to get where you're going. Target fixation. Um, if you look at something, you're going to hit something. So look past it. Um, this example is a cow. Our examples are more wildlife, like elk, deer, stuff like that. So if you see something in the road, you're going to want to steer around it. I know I said roadway design doesn't have a big issue on it. Sometimes um, it's the poorly maintained roads. And you guys, and, and the stuff you guys are doing, aren't going to be driving on the, the best of roads. So that's something to take into consideration as you're out there driving. Another thing is, um, uh, with bad weather, maybe the sand trucks, snow, or, uh, salt trucks, whatever, mag chloride, they're not getting that down in time, so you're sliding down a hill. So unfortunately, that's just how it is, especially in our mountainous areas. This one is a truck that goes through a red light and he meets the front end of a semi that T-bones him, so that's not a good one. So, are all accidents crashes? Are all crashes accidents? I think state patrol is kind of trying to say everything's a crash now because there, there's so many distractions going on. An accident is, oh, what was it, that, that guardrail I didn't mean to, but being distracted, they're, they're saying more and more that it's crash stuff. Um, I'll leave that one alone. I, I don't know who's driving. Um, so we will, when we're talking about the, the crash priority system, obviously life is the key thing. If you can do anything to change your car, the, the way it's going to save your life or somebody else's life that's outside of the car, that's your priority. Um, then you want to minimize injuries. So if it's a bad example, but if you got a person on a bike, Hitting them head on or clipping their their back tire, which is best. Neither. So neither is right. That's why I said it's a bad example, but it, it's something to think about. Head on, probably less chance of, of surviving versus clipping, maybe breaking a, a, a leg, something along those lines. And then sheet metal. Your insurance rates are going to go up, but you can always replace those. This one doesn't go into it as much, but zones of protection. Um, so basically, if, if you think of your car, driver, front passenger, and then you go around. So the zone of protection, if you're in there by yourself, that's the one you want to keep the safest, right? So if, you, if you're going into some situation, whether, say, you're driving straight onto a, a wall, do you want to hit head on, or do you want to try and turn and maybe skid down the side of that wall? Something along those lines because you're trying to keep yourself safe. We already talked a little bit about uh, night driving factors. I mean, not only are you tired, people around you are probably tired. Uh, chances of people drinking are higher out there. Reduce visibility, you can't see when it's getting darker. And then uh, speed, perception errors. Uh, at dark, things just look different. Um, at night, you don't want to drive faster than you can. Your headlights can see, right? Now we have a lot of cars have LED bulbs, um, so they can actually project a lot further. But that doesn't mean you can drive faster. You still got to be within in those limits. Um, 
hopefully if there's uh, pedestrians out on the road, they're wearing light colored clothing because it's, it's a little bit um, easier to see in a way. Um, and then your pupils dilating. Um, who knows what the white line is called on the highways? The fog line? Yeah. So instead of looking at oncoming traffic at those headlights and getting your pupils dilated, and then they pass by and you can't see, look at that fog line, because that, that'll help you um, not get that night blindness. Star Wars fans, who likes to drive with their bright lights on so it looks like you're going warp speed? It happens, right? Um, just night driving, then you add the weather on top of it, it it's, it's even worse. Um, a lot of the problems we're having now is lighting technology is getting so much better. You don't have those halogen bulbs in the headlights anymore to heat up and to get the snow to melt off the cars. So now they're the LED bulbs, so the, the lights are not, uh, they're getting blocked easier. So something to think about if you have a newer car like that and the weather's bad, um, making sure you're cleaning those off before you're going places. I think we've, we've beat this one, but little little laughter in there. So we talked about it. Good driving equals smooth driving. The smoother you drive, the, the better your experience is for you, your passengers, everybody else around you. Um, don't drive dramatically. Again, people are going to be watching you. Um, and then practice with your passengers. My, it was a few years back when my kids were younger. Um, and my wife was telling me they were passing an accident scene and my son from the back seat says, I bet the kids were jacking around, causing them not to be able to drive well and pay attention that they got in an accident. So, and then there's no need, I mean, gas prices are going up now, why, why are we racing our engines? You don't need a speed to get somewhere, um, just lightly feather the gas and brake. It, it'll do wonders for your car, your, your wallet, all that stuff and ma make your driving better. I mean, easy enough, just easy, easy, slow driving, have your heel on the floorboard, um, gas brake, just make it easy. Um, this is leading into some, some of our trailering stuff. Four wheel drive, sorry, the next one's talking about four wheel drive. Just don't take advantage of it. You don't want to end up like that guy. Obviously, the four-wheel drive has that higher center of gravity, um, so you don't want to be tipping over and having issues with that. If you go forward one more. This is just talking about the, the heavier car, the, the bigger your trailer. Um, you need increased distance there. There we go, travel. Trailer towing is the next one. So this is even more so with the, the mirrors. You want to be able to see what's next to your trailer and beyond that, right? So you're going to have to set those mirrors even a little more differently. Um, slow and steady braking, like we talked about. And that brings up a good point here that, that Bruce and I were talking about. Um, a lot of your trucks, if you're towing, use that tow haul mode. It helps, it changes everything in the engine. It helps slow your truck down as you're going. Um, you don't want to go more than, say, five miles an hour over the speed limit as you're going downhill. So then you'll, you'll brake, get down to about five miles an hour under, and then let, let the engine do the work for you, or even gear down if you need to. Um, that way you're not wearing on your brakes, because if you're coming down from a, we'll see it all the time on I-70, you know, with the truckers. Um, if they're going too fast, they're not checking their brakes, um, they got those runaway truck ramps everywhere. So just take it easy as, as you're driving. Again, you want to get there safely. And if you get there, or if you um, can't do it with adequate brakes, you're not going to get there to be able to help people out. So um, wide turns. Um, everybody knows you can't go straight and make that uh, hard turn to the right or left. You're going to take out everything on your side. So you want to make wide turns with that. We talked about all this stuff already. Um, just make sure you know your blind spots. Obviously, 
I don't think anybody here is going to be driving an 18 wheeler to respond to anything, but know that uh, those are their blind spots. We talked about tow haul mode in these. Everybody here has a different driving experience, right? We're going to have younger people, older people, um, more experienced driving, towing, doing whatever. Not everybody's going to agree on, on what's going on with driving. We just need to make sure we get there safely. So, um, like it says there, reasonable people with good intentions can still disagree over the matters of substance. Just know that you guys are all trying to do one, one good mission and you need to get there safely. Next, we'll talk about emergency driving, and this is, this is some of the key points we, we had talked about. So, um, everybody has light sirens on their cars, right? No. Not all? Okay. So, um, that, those of you that do, you fall into that, that, that emergency vehicle exception, right? So, you still have to operate with due regard, um, but understand, are we beeping again? Okay, um, and this is something we try to get over to our, our deputies all the time. Speeds and excess of the speed limit are rarely justified. And again, you guys are going to save a life. There's no reason to jeopardize yours or another while you're, you're responding, right? So there's no reason to go over the speed limit. Um, drivers do unexpected things. That, there's so many distractions, we, we don't know what may happen. So. This is something, intersections are a very big um, accident area. We, we have deputies getting tagged all the time. So the key thing is, you're not just gonna, even if you have your lights and sirens, you're not gonna be blown through intersections. You're gonna come up to it, preferably in that left lane, and you're gonna, you're gonna inch out. You're gonna make sure traffic coming from your left is slowing down, sees you. You're gonna go one lane at a time. And then you're going to look into the traffic coming from your right, one lane at a time. We just had a deputy about a month ago now. He was doing that same thing, thought he was clear. All the traffic um, coming from the north in the number one lane had stopped. And so he thought he was in the clear. He was inching out and somebody, a lady in a smaller car, didn't see him, came through and T-boned him. So the, these are the most dangerous situations when you guys are going through those things. It's just, you, you have to be very, very methodical as you're going through there because you don't want to get hit. So look at, think about the, the siren when you have that going on. Um, in a residential area, trees and hedges might absorb those sirens. Um, if you're in a tall building, it may make it go different areas. If you're going to the mountains, they're gonna hear you coming forever, right? So just think about that. But you don't want to outdrive, like we talked about the headlights, you don't want to outdrive the sirens either. If uh, people can't hear you coming because you're going too fast coming up on them, that, that's also an issue. So like we said, your speed increases, your siren decreases, your speed increases, um, your accident chances go up and then your emergency equipment, everybody, we have an issue with officers thinking, well, I got all my emergency equipment on. The world has to, to you know, go around me. That's not how it is anymore. Um, and then with that speed going up, tunnel vision. I'm sure you guys, when you're responding to something, it's not just a couple miles down the road. It's, it's a long time. So you need, like we talked about, look at the whole world around you as you're going. Um, key thing in this, um, as you're driving, you may think, oh, I'll use my hazard lights. It's another thing to show that I'm, I'm, I'm coming up on people. But if you think about it, if you, if you have your hazards on and you're trying to signal a turn, it's not going to be working the same way, right? So just use whatever lights you have on there, maybe flash your headlights. Um, a big thing we try and teach is as you're coming up to those intersections or you're coming up to to stop traffic cycle your siren 
Um, I don't know if you guys have air horns or not, just something to change it up. Because the, the constant sound, somebody, it might not work in their ears, but if you change it and they hear that, it's something that changes them. They're like, oh, got to get over it. Uh, can you go back to that last one? Um, so with traffic, we talked about construction going on I-70, um, sometimes it's just backed up and you're going to create confusion, um, more issues if you're, the, the siren works people up. If you're trying to get somewhere, get as far over on the left as you can and um, just use your lights so people can see you. If you need to cycle the siren once or twice to get their attention, to get them to move over, that's what you need to do. Um, but with construction zones, it's, it's going to be tough. Traffic's already bottlenecking as it is, but get over to the left, work your way through. Um, nobody, we talked about um, the toll lanes. Um, nobody's immune from those cameras that are out there. We have deputies with the red light cameras that are following ambulances to hospitals that they get their picture taken and they get a ticket in the mail. Um, that's something you guys are going to have to cover um, administratively and say, no, this person, if, if that happens, if you guys get a ticket for being in a toll lane, you can, the picture clearly shows that you're, you're responding or, or you are responding that, um, hit up the, the toll company or whoever's running those cameras and say, no, I was on an emergency response for this. And they, they should, um, yeah, we we'll talk with the sheriff's department about some of the, the toll lanes and they say they use them even when they're X'd out. You know, if they're on okay. emergencies, and you just gotta be careful with that too, because sometimes they're ex the toll lanes. Yes, they're exed out for a reason, or if you're even going through the tunnel for exactly. whatever reason, it's exed out for a reason. Uh, there, there's there's something going on there, so um, just just be cognizant of your driving along those lines. So, um, I guess while we're on that, I'll, I'll cover some of these things that we're talking about. Um, Driving code in Denver. Um, somebody laughs about that. I, I did a little bit of research into this, and apparently the Denver traffic code, it says that volunteer emergency vehicles, you have to get a permit through them to be recognized as an emergency vehicle. So I don't know how many of you guys are responding from Denver, but just know that, that that's the issue. That's, that's what I found out. Is that on the city streets or on the main highways too? It's just within the city. I would assume within the city. Denver has a bunch of weird rules and that, that's the only thing. I haven't talked to anybody about it, but that's what I found when I was researching online. So um, that, that's, that's the rule. So, um, You're saying in the city of County, Denver? Yeah. yeah. Because we have our position for Who oh, speak up? <clears throat> I just wonder if people that do respond to the like myself, I don't turn on until I get to 6th Avenue. And I'm on 6th Avenue all the way to 7th. Yeah, and I mean, you gotta, I'm assuming you're coming on at like Santa Fe, Calumet, that's yeah. what we're talking about. You're almost out of Denver. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. Denver has weird rules. They talk about concealed carry and all that stuff. You know, they, they have all these different rules. So. Just maybe check with them to see um, what their issues are. Yeah, I got a that, that's what they're saying. Is you have to have a permit. Yeah. Well, I'll check with the sheriff. The sheriff. I didn't know we had to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years ago, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, and then we're. Um, <laughs> Bruce was talking about um, the sheriff. Uh, Albers, is it still Albers up there? Doesn't like that you guys run code through Georgetown. Just be considerate yeah. um, of the towns you're going through. A lot of them are tiny. Um, if you need to turn your sirens off, do that, but still use your lights. And a lot of the, the CRS talks about um, lights or sirens. I don't know many people that run with just their sirens on. 
it's usually lights to get people's attention and they cycle their siren. So just, just be considerate in the cities you're going through. Um, I, I don't know that, I, I haven't heard of that being a big issue in the city, but maybe the mountain towns are more of an issue. So. Um, Ubers? Yeah. Yeah. Two things you would share that he said for us, and if it's back up, if it's not moving, he's given us. He's I, can't hear, I can't hear you. If, if I said it's backed up, yeah. before you go, he says you can go um, off to the right, and, uh, or he says put your vehicle right in between the two two lanes of that so people can move out. Split them. So you're not moving everybody from the left lane. Yeah. And I know that's tough because there's not much room there, but I'd be very hesitant on going to the right side because somebody could see you and the, the, they've always been taught. You're going five miles an hour. Just yeah, it, it's, it's probably a case-by-case -case basis. So just do what common sense says. I mean, again, you're trying to get there to, right. to save people. So. Not to interrupt, but on that same point, I mean, for all the ambulance driving that I've done with different agencies, they've just told us stay left. Everybody's been told to move to the right. If you do that and then somebody panics and moves to the right, they could, you know. Yeah, you could be at potentially fault. at fault. Um, yeah. So uh, every agency I've worked with in four different states have all said stay left, just Okay. Stay back enough so they can see the lights because some of the bigger trucks. That's the thing, yeah. You don't want to be right on up, up on their bumper. They can't see it. this. You want to be able to see those lights. Well, I can't see the avenue. The biggest thing that's happened in all the years I do is they don't go right, they, they park it. You know, that's yeah. Right. That's now, right. you got, yeah. now you got a bigger problem because you got traffic going mm -hmm. 55 and you're stopped and they're stopped. Yeah. And and it, push it, away. Again, again, it's going to be that case by case and you're just going to have to work with what you have. If you have to go around them to the right, hopefully they stay there. Just wave at them, hold your fingers up, wave at them and go by. <laughs> yes? I'm curious to get your take on this. Um, so we, we, a lot of our response area is west on 70, right? So right. we run emergent, you know, from Jetco or, you know, west on I-70. Mm -hmm. Would you, so when that new tolling opening left, would you run an emergent in that tolling, pushing people out, or would you run in the middle lane? I would still be. Left lane, I, guess. I would still be in that left lane. I mean, it's it's a toll lane, um, and people have to complain. I, I don't know how often the cameras are there taking pictures of all their stuff, but that that's what people are taught to to go to the right. And it's not like on the East Coast where there's delinear poles keeping that HOV lane. Um, Strictly in that, so if they need it, I would stay to the left. That's that's my preference. So like, drive in the toll lane. Yeah, and then you're you're responding to an emergency, and you guys can deal with the administrative part after that. If, if they're taking are we issues. are we cool with trucks and trailers doing that? Okay. That that's the other thing too, because you're not necessarily supposed to drive in those in trailer with trailers. So that's I I, I honestly I don't know the the emergency response on towing the trailer. We can try to talk with with Albers, but Diane over there has said we're in the if it's clear we're in the you know the shutdown toll lane if we need to be with whatever to get through, um, and we'll deal with the nasty notes later. Generally, you're not exceeding the speed limit. Going, generally, you're not exceeding the speed limit. It's going straight there anyway, and most other drivers on the road are. So what's the point of trying to go? No, I mean, is there a problem going faster than you unless you're exceeding the speed limit? Well, with our heavy trucks, most people are passing this anyway. Yep. Not speeding. You know? Yeah, not speeding. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what we're using. Except for what Jerry's right. Yeah. Back. If you want to go to the next one there, video about emergency driving. Um, the assisted fire team, me told you that this is one of the harshest punishments his department has ever handed down. Tonight, a young firefighter is facing a harsh punishment for being blamed for causing this violent collision between a Miami fire rescue engine and an ambulance. 
The chief of Miami Fire was when describing the firefighters' actions as, quote, grossly negligent and unsafe. He went on to say the actions endangered the lives of citizens and firefighters. He's been suspended for 96 hours, which is an incredible one of the biggest suspensions that you can, um, you can have. On August 11th, 2015, the first responder was behind the wheel of this ambulance, transporting a grandmother and two children to Jackson Memorial Hospital. That's when investigators say he blew a red light, colliding with a fire engine, responding to a separate call. Our policy in the past was you had to slow down and yield to oncoming traffic when you were approaching either a stop sign or a red light. He failed to do that. <laughs> Cell phone video shows you the chaos. Firefighters trying to rescue the victims, all of it unfolding at the intersection of Northwest 12th Avenue and 14th Street near Jackson Memorial Hospital. The crash injured a dozen, including seven firefighters and two people who were riding in this car. I was shocked that there were no serious injuries and or somebody didn't lose their life. A wake up call that's bringing change to the city's fire department. Now we're requiring all members when they come to a stop sign or they come to a red light, the apparatus and vehicles must come to a complete stop before proceeding. You don't want to be that guy. It just talks about is it worth the risk? Um, there's a note in here that says, is the minute or two you're saving? driving faster worth putting your life at risk or other lives for that matter and then studies show that EMS per personnel die more often than police and fire and traffic collisions um, and many of those are preventable I mean look at that fire truck and ambulance what's what's the timing on that I think with that, I've wrapped up. The, the one last thing we were talking about, and you guys will see it when you're up at the track, is we, we call it apex driving. Um, let me see. Can you go back to slide 41? I'll just use this as an example. It's not the clearest picture, but if you look at it, see, as you're going into a curve, who knows what the apex of the this turn would be, the, the, the top. So basically, yeah, where B is. So as you're going, you want to do all your braking as you're going into the turn, right? Then you start turning, and just past the apex is when you want to start accelerating again. So um, that, that's the best way to do cornering, and you guys will get to experience that when you go up to the track so um, if, if you do if you break when you're in the curve chances are you're gonna oversteer and potentially roll so that, that's the best thing to do so um, anybody have questions like I said I, I think I shaved off probably 20 minutes with the videos not working so you're welcome <laughs> Do you have any other questions, Bruce? No.